Well, Rowan, welcome back home. How's life in La Rochelle? How are you finding things? Yes, yeah, great. It's been um, full on, actually. We had a nice break this weekend. Um, next week, we're going to 13 weekends in a row. So uh, that's exciting. And it's um, it's um, exactly what I knew I was getting, getting into. Um, I've come from, obviously, the Crusaders, one environment to a French environment. And um, plenty of challenges, but uh, also... Uh, I suppose uh, plenty of, th of things to get stuck into. Uh, season so far has been average, um, but uh, hopefully implementing um, uh, a few um, a few tools that, that we need to keep going forward. Very exciting working with John O'Gibbs as the director of rugby. Uh, a lot of good guys from the uh, that have been there before. It's a club that has probably not much history in the top fourteen and have done well in the previous seasons, but. Um, now we're looking to make, I suppose, uh, steps towards challenging for silverware, but we're a bit away from that, so let's see how it goes. What are the biggest challenges you found stepping up as a head coach? Uh, I think, um, I suppose, trying to get everyone to buy into your message. You might ask what my message is, but I suppose you've got to you got to go to the training ground to hear that. But it's 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 uh, it's a time for, um, I think. Um, getting a game plan across to your, to your players, one that they enjoy, one that they believe in, and then you got to empower them really as the players. Um, there are different challenges in the fact that we're all from different uh, spots around the world, basically different cultures, different uh, ways of viewing the game, but um, first three, four months have been, have been hugely exciting. Yes, there has been challenges, there'll be challenges in every French club, that's the way it is, but uh, the language barrier is is a challenge but it's not insurmountable so um, what we're trying to do at the minute is kind of get get the players uh, to believe in the project and then once you have that you'll go forward you won't get all of them on board but you get um, hopefully the majority of them and we've had been boosted by a few Fijians coming back from the World Cup uh, Greg Aldridge from the French camp and uh, Jeffrey Dumaru who was injured so this week was was uh, hugely promising because we got that kind of I suppose um, that uh, just um, it's great to see people of that quality coming back on the pitch. A lot of guys, a lot of young players, big emphasis on our academy because if you don't have local players, you don't have anything. So we need these guys that are from the La Rochelle area um, trying to become French internationals. That was one of the strengths, I think, of my era playing with Munster. There was an awful lot of good people from Cork, Limerick, Tipperary that eventually became I suppose Munster stalwarts and Ireland stalwarts and then that's what you want to try and do with the um, with the the youth of La Rochelle, they want to I suppose be uh, have an identity and we have to have players from La Rochelle and then we've got to be very selective in, in how we recruit because it's very different to other French models in the fact that there's no sugar daddy or, or anything like that. It, it's, I think, over 650 individual uh, sponsors who, who who buy into the club or who want to be associated with the club. So um, in that regard, uh, everything is kind of accountable for as opposed to just um, writing off X, Y and Z player if he isn't performing. And in terms of, you've obviously played for Munster, played for Ireland, you've had stints with Racing and then most recently with the Crusaders. What kind of influence has that brought to you as a head coach, you know, having those stints, particularly in those coaching stints? Yeah, it is, but sure. I went into, I finished playing with Munster, went straight into Racing, so it was a very different mindset, obviously. Didn't know much about it. I was just trying to, knew I liked rugby and knew I wanted to be a coach. and. Uh, but I think you're always learning. Uh, every day is, is an opportunity to get better or to, or, or to learn. You have to do that. I'm, I'm still very young as a coach and I'm still kind of learning on the job. I have a fair idea, probably strong idea of how I want the game to be played in my own head. But I have to get that. It's no point having those ideas in my head. I have to get that message across to the players. And you need good buy-in from your players, but you also need their ideas as well. So sometimes the message on the outside might seem... Um, that you have an awful lot of, amount of work to do, but for me it's kind of making sure that everyone is aligned and making sure that we have I suppose, a simple game plan at first and then we can add to that. Um, yeah, the experience in the Crusaders, no doubt, was, was, was most definitely life-changing because I got to work with brilliant 
brains of the game from a player's point of view but also from coach's point of view so uh, you're definitely a better coach as a result of that but you know it would be an error trying to replicate what you do in the Crusaders in La Rochelle because the environment is completely different and it's one person going from one environment into another but the environments are incomparable at the moment but uh, there's a, so many good things in the Crusaders but there aren't that many good things in, in La Rochelle at the minute but that's not to say it, it can't be and they have strengths of their own and they play a different game and they're different uh, they're different people and it's a different championship you got to value different things it's refereed differently so from that regard it's it's a case of um, you know not being uh, not to over analyze it but um, make sure what you want to install you install well so I guess there's adaption on both sides really for you as a head coach having to adapt to the players that you've now inherited and then of course them trying to get it get used to you that's exactly it yeah and it's a great word you use you have to adapt I think you need to be flexible with players nowadays I think players are changing even from year to year I think you look at the younger players coming through they're very different to when I came into the game the game is very different to when I came into it as a young fella so it's very important that um, you know how to speak to your players and uh, and what buttons to push and I think that's the man management side of it is hugely important even though uh, some of the principles of the game remain I think uh, a 20 year old nowadays is very different to a 20 year old 20 years ago and that's reality people would say well they have to change to you no you have to change to them they're your players so you need to get the best out of them so that's up to me and that's hopefully something I enjoy and enjoy hopefully being able to um, get into them and, and get the best out of them that's the challenge every day and but that's a very enjoyable um, um, cha challenge for me do you have a date in mind or a time in mind when you'd like to come back to Ireland to coach? No, genuinely I don't. I've kind of been asked that a lot. I don't look upon it like that. I for, think for years one and two when I became got into coaching, that was all I ever wanted to do. But no, uh, if I didn't enjoy La Rochelle, I wouldn't be there. I, I find it um, a great challenge. There's, there's massive frustration in that, but there's also massive satisfaction in that. Um, you know, I think it's important that um, you're continuously trying to get the best out of yourself, and uh, and that's what I'm doing. La Rochelle, as I said, I've got a, a good director of rugby. Get on well with him. Um, get on well with the players. It's it's uh, up to me to try and um, upskill that club to a level where we can challenge for for silverware. I don't think we're there at the minute. We might be there uh, relatively soon, but that doesn't stop anything you've got to have massive inner drive and desire to achieve these things and that's what I have when you look at the coaches that have come into the Irish provinces of late uh, you've got Richard Cockrell you've got Stephen Lark and Robin McBride how difficult is it for an Irish coach to get established within one of the provinces here oh, I don't think it's I don't think it's it's difficult really I think um, there's different I suppose avenues or, or routes into that and it depends what what you want I think you look at the job Leo Cullen has done with Leinster and uh, he's been brilliant and I think um, you know I mean that's that's the blueprint for for an awful lot of Irish coaches I think um, he he, uh, he was smart enough to get experience around him he, he, he got a master stroke and getting Stuart Lancaster with him but but it's not all Stuart Lancaster either you know I think he's he's excellent what he does but Leo is obviously the the, the rock of Leinster and has been there for so long but and he knows that place inside out but there's uh, you know I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of good people in Connacht a lot of good people in Munster uh, not so many I suppose uh, Munster people in Munster at the minute but that's 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 not the issue I don't think I think the issue is trying to be successful you know I think people sometimes make the error that um you need local people to be successful. I don't think you do. I think what you need is a really united management team and a really good management team because the management team is as important as the playing roster. And if you get that right, I think you give huge direction to your players. Uh, it's very hard for the players to have huge direction unless they have a, a really united management team. And you could see perhaps, um, you know, I mean, in Munster, uh, it probably wasn't the case. So 
Um, Leinster, yeah, I think there's, they seem very aligned. They seem to know exactly what they're doing. Connacht, I think, is a good example. There seems to be great alignment there. Obviously, even Australian there, but you've an awful lot of local uh, Connacht ex players and great coaches there that are doing doing a good job and they're, you know, what I mean, uh, under the radar, but they're tipping away really well and they could pose big problems for teams this season from a national point of view. Um, for the national team, if you want to work with the national team, you got to be the best. And the IRFU are going to employ the best people, and that's the challenge for for whoever you are. It doesn't matter where you're born or where you're raised or where you're from. If you're good enough, you get the job. You mentioned the coaching setup with Munster. A lot was made of Felix Jones and Jerry Flannery leaving. Do you think that there was more to it than meets the eye? That there was things weren't quite right there. Um, I don't know because. Um, Obviously, uh, you'd be um, friendly with Jerry, so I spoke to him a little bit, but there was something, I think, that there wasn't uh, complete alignment or uh, the same vision from, from Felix, Jerry and, uh, and Johan. That, that was my, my takings uh, from it. I, I tried to probe around the area, but uh, I suppose, in fairness to Jerry, the, um, the character that he is, I think the respect he has for Munster Rugby, he wasn't saying anything. but. Um, you know, it, it was disappointing and it is disappointing that, that uh, Jerry and Felix leave Munster, but maybe now they have harmony in their coaching staff and, and that's all the supporters want. They're craving success down there. And um, if you can get that uh, coaching group humming, I think, um, hopefully they have serious players. I think you look at the back line in Munster, if you go through it, you've, you know, I mean, you've Conor Murray, you've Carberry, you've. Uh, you know, I mean, a number of centres to pick from in terms of a lot of them are internationals. Uh, and you look at the back three, uh, you know, I mean, with someone like Earls, Conway, um, Mike Haley playing well as well. Mike Haley playing well, uh, Darren Sweetenham playing well. Um, I'm after leaving out, who am I after leaving out? There's, there's, um, there's a lot of wingers there um, that can. Um, that have done. Uh, I said Conway, Earls, Sweetenham, uh, Haley. Um, who plenty, 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 plenty there. Who am I missing? No, I'm missing someone. Um, <coughs> it'll come to me. But there's, there's a lot of uh, a lot of scope there, and um, I think, um, you know, there's. It's just uh, rugby is so important in in Munster, and it, it's uh, it's time for these guys to show their worth. We were talking about Felix Jones. Things have gone quite well for him <laughs> over the last few weeks, haven't they? Yeah. yeah some of the the impact that he would have made to the Springboks and what he would have brought to their game. Yeah. Well, I think it's probably been a whirlwind for himself to even suggest that it's happened. Um, you know, I think they were nearly at the World Cup when he got the when he got the nod to come in. So obviously, um, he w it was a short period of time, but for himself, uh, it must be absolutely hugely. Uh, rewarding and satisfying for him to come in and to, to uh, I suppose there's two elements to it to work with a World Cup winning team but also to know he had a, a contribution in making the World Cup, Rugby World Cup champions uh, did he have a massive input? Probably not that's not the point the point is he's 32 years of age uh, he'll always have that he's a medal in his back pocket now and that must be some feeling for him and um, you know, you just be particularly pleased for him because he's a guy that was uh, always hard working. He was always honest. He was always kind of really well prepared, and he was always uh, had a smile on his face. I think, um, you know, there was another good guy to pay, put an awful lot into Monster Rugby too. Would be Alad, the the strength and conditioner coach, who had been with, I suppose, South Africa for a long time, and it would have been his program. So in terms of uh, you know what I mean the planning the periodization when we need the peak that would all have been his and you could see that they have some amount of athletes on the pitch so um, it was um, it was a particularly big weekend for those two especially and of course Razi turning things around with South Africa they were in bad shape when he took over there yeah they were they were rock bottom there's no doubt about it you look at it, at their results and, and and where they were I think um, what he did was he he took stock for a little bit, realised he needs South Africans from all around the world, doesn't matter where they're playing, I'm going to get the best, created the best forward pack that packs couldn't live with, 
they got their best performance in a final um, when they destroyed England up front and I think that was the, that's the beauty for people that are I suppose big fans of the game there was a fear sometimes of rugby union becoming rugby league because of the body shapes changing and the athletes uh, but you could see yesterday that Razzie had a plan to go after England in the scrum he picked a scrummage and tight head uh, he picked two brilliant loose heads and um, you know I think from England's point of view it couldn't have worked out any worse than the fact that St Clair getting injured in th after three minutes it has a massive effect on the game there's no other way of saying it and the fact that Eddie Jones in his head if you're if you're plotting worst case scenario you're probably um, Dan Coles comes in for 30 minutes he comes in for 77 minutes you don't have extra legs for him or expertise at tight head what are you to do um, you know the coach and me was saying do you essentially bend the rules or do you become cynical and, and make them uh, uncontestable scrums because the game was decided by, by penalties up front and I don't know you have to find a way to win no matter what it takes and um, you just well, the French got in trouble against Wales and for, for doing that during the Six Nations recently didn't they so yeah but you're getting in trouble if you World Cup medal you don't matter do you <laughs> and, but in terms of when you look at the back at the Rugby World Cup do you think that the best team won it um, it's interesting your question I think you look at it okay so South Africa lose to New Zealand have recovery games against Namibia Canada and Italy a quarter final win against Japan, a semi final win against Wales, and beat England in a final. It's a good route. You look at England's route, Argentina in, in the first game, um, two other games to get, f to get up to speed, form. The, our, sorry, the game against France called off, so you can reload the tank and fill up the battery again. Then for them to be world champions, you have to beat Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. I think what I take out of it is that if you're to beat New Zealand, you got to empty the tank. England didn't have time to refill it. They got beaten by 20 points in a the final. They gave it a good go, but I thought no matter what people say, your, your attitude or your emotions uh, change when you beat New Zealand. I didn't think that um, that hunger is the wrong word but I think that um, level of mental alertness energy, I guess, was there yesterday as it was before um, the New Zealand England game from, from England's point of view it just you have to you have to empty the tank or go to the well to beat to beat New Zealand England won all the scraps against New Zealand South Africa won all the scraps yesterday they won every break and ball they won every 50-50 they just were a little bit stronger in contact and um, England too were probably I would say unlucky for me it was a 100% forward pass with that, that decision when they, when uh, South Africa were only leading by six points the TMO said nothing clear and obvious for me it is clear and obvious but um, it's a big moment 6-13 to 13, because the rules change if it's a one, when it becomes a two score game you can cheat on the offside line you can cheat in giving away penalties if it's a six point game South Africa know that if they give away a penalty England kick it into the 22 they can get a mall going and they just get energy uh, f to push for one, for for um, to, clo to kind of close back the gap for a one score game if it's a two score game you're just playing against the clock you're not really playing against the opposition and in terms of Ireland, um, can you pinpoint where you think they went wrong? No, I don't because it's probably a lot of areas I think that uh, um, they'd be very disappointed with in the fact that it wasn't just a New Zealand game. It seemed to me that it was um, a nine month issue, all of 2019 resulting in probably getting a snapshot in the World Cup of what we'd seen in the previous nine months so you know I think like Ireland were 12-3 up against Japan people forget that but they didn't score for maybe over an hour and then from that game on their campaign looked uh, looked dead and against New Zealand it was such a 
they'll say it was some, you know I mean small margins but it, I thought it was a, it was an incredible mismatch because in a quarter final usually they're they're close but this was one way of traffic for the whole game so um to say where it went wrong no I actually genuinely think you probably have to um have a have a complete review because from 2011 to 15 to 19 I think um, you know if you always do what you always did you'd always get what you always got so I don't think um, anything will change unless you, you have a serious review and sit down and say well this is because there was definitely focus and doing well in 2015 in 2011 yeah but it was probably a game against Wales where gone through a campaign where unbeaten and then you, you lose in a quarter final because it just a little bit off on the day but 2015 there was there was injuries but it was still 20 points and 2019 it, it went further backwards compared to other world cups so what is blatantly obvious is that we don't get it right at world cups but that's easy to say we need solutions and we need to know why and that's i think why you know as a Ex international, it, it, it was. It hit me hard. It, it hit a lot of people hard, and I think uh, you lose a lot of credibility in the fact that you go well in Six Nations, but then what we're essentially judged on is rugby World Cups. And for all of us, me working in France, you just you can see people looking at you a little bit differently because I don't think they they back Ireland when it comes to it. Do you think there's too much short-termism in terms of targeting the Six Nations? Do you think that there is, needs to be a different mindset? I think different mindset, yes, but short-termism, no, because I think you always have to be looking at what's next. But you have to look at what's next with, with, the, with the, big, the big target, because every other nation judges themselves on what happens at a Rugby World Cup. And, and I think we do too, but we haven't got it right, but we need to try and get it right, but we won't get it right if we... If we go off bitching in different directions, you need kind of unity on this and you need to, to go after because some people take joy in Ireland failing at this. I would be the complete opposite. I would want to be part of a think tank or part of a team that could, you know I mean, massive burning desire inside of me to try and feature as a coach at a Rugby World Cup. That's, that's uh, goes without saying so. But you need a lot of good brains and a good minds coming together to try and get it right because um, this one, it just looked... Um, way off compared to where this team were in the past and that's what makes it very disappointing. There were a lot of accusations that the team didn't evolve from 2018 to 2019 and I guess there was the warning there from that England game in February and that almost wasn't heeded and then it just seemed to trickle on. Yeah it's a hard one because you can be sure Joe Schmidt wanted the team to evolve and he wanted this team to be more successful than the other Irish team going to a Rugby World Cup so but um, you know, it's it's very hard to actually uh, pinpoint where and how it exactly went wrong. Um, I I think one of the big things I take from from my own point of view was just I suppose um, valuing experienced players versus players in form. I think that's something that needs to be looked at, and it's something I I probably would look at a little bit differently myself going forward. I. Uh, for example, Chris Farrell was in splendid form against um, Scotland, I think it was, wasn't he, when he came off the bench mm. or very early in the game and had a, a, had a massive game. Conway was another guy that was in form. Um, a few of the forwards uh, were probably in, in form and then... Um, Jordan Larmer, of course, as well. He played yeah, very well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, I think he just uh, he has something, e something extra or something um, a lot of x-factor that that probably in, in in Ireland we don't have that many players with x-factor he most definitely uh, has but uh, then you, it depends on what way the coaching team want to set up their team you know I probably would have that mindset myself where you'd probably like your 15 to be very dependable very secure and it, it, it's about getting that balance and I think um, you know, it's we're all experts after the event, but it, you can be sure I, these uh, discussions or what ifs were talked about in, in, in that coaching group. But 
uh, one thing that you can't replicate is, is no form and we had lots of players who weren't in peak form in the no and that's something that I think uh, transcended throughout the team because there was no one given the team that that uh, that go forward that probably uh, front football that had been happening in the past. Do you think Joe was almost risk averse because you could almost pick Joe Schmidt's team even before he'd seen it you know was he a bit too predictable in selection and then with that in mind was it easier to prepare to play against Ireland as an opponent? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I, I, I don't think risk averse for me is the right word. I think you're right about the team did become predictable. I think what would have been brilliant, potentially after maybe the um, the Japanese game or even going back to. Um, the England game and Twickenham, it might have been a good example, irrespective of what stage of your of your pre season you are, but to take nearly fifty points in a so called friendly doesn't go well because all that group was going to a World Cup and that shouldn't happen. So maybe after that you could have sent a strong message and said, Okay, these guys aren't playing. I'm gonna shake this up and I'm gonna change in a few of my senior players, I'm gonna change in this and that just to send, but I think it was probably uh it's hard then to get the to get the balance right between um, trusting the guys that have really delivered for Ireland over the years and putting in a, a so-called rookie in those position, but that's that's his choice. Well, I guess New Zealand did it with a couple of wingers, you know, and Bridge and, and Reese. Yeah, and then the flip side of that is for the England game. And they got found out somewhat, but. No, I wouldn't say found out but the fact that you, I think you have to understand how much of even for guys that haven't been there they ask what experience is so experience is uh, putting yourself in a position and doing it better than you did the previous time so from New Zealand's point of view four of those backs didn't have qualifying experience in Leonard Brown um, Severis, George Bridge and Goodhu they could have easily gone for a midfield of Crotty, Sonny Bill Williams, Ricky Ioni on the left, Ben Smith uh, at 15, or on, on the right wing and Bowden Barrett. You know, and I think maybe their game against Wales in the third and fourth place showed that because it's very hard f for when you get so much out of certain players one Saturday, how did they do that the following Saturday? But what message then do you say to these guys that have put a record score in Ireland and saying, okay, you did brilliant last week, but I'm not playing you for the semi-final from New Zealand's point of view. So it's... It's, it's a tough quandary. But in terms of going back to Ireland, um, Andy Farrell, obviously part of that coaching team and now steps up as a head coach. Is he under immediate pressure to deliver? I don't think so, no. I think the great thing about Andy Farrell is his own man. Always was. was broke all the rules playing rugby league for for Wigan Great Britain uh, this guy's a serious operator uh, I think uh, when you spend a, a little bit of time with him you kind of understand that quickly I think he'll go up about it very differently I think people have to be um, realistic in in, um, in how they appraise the team uh, there's an awful lot of good rugby players playing in Ireland I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't lose uh, lose the faith at any stage um, in terms of of um, where this team is going. I think what everyone um, who wants to see this team succeed, they have to realise that the approach or the yes, the approach to the, to our approach to the Rugby World Cup hasn't been right. It needs to be absolutely. Uh, looked at um, inside out upside down to try and find better ways of going about it um, is there an issue with minutes played before it is there a way of looking at it from why do you break for the months of June, July August, September but that theory is put to bed by the fact that you look at how well England and Wales did in, in, in this Rugby World Cup so um, you know, all of a sudden, uh, what language are you using? What is the mindset going to the next one? Because um, if you don't get beyond the quarterfinal, is it already four years out and there's a there's a massive um, noose hanging around these guys' necks before even a ball is kicked? So I think you need to you need to explore how best to go about it. But I think 
the great thing about being in New Zealand is that uh, spending time there is that their their mindset is is what can go right as opposed to what can go wrong and I think that's it's a very different way to looking at it that, that sometimes we look at it in this country we can always sometimes well this can go wrong that'll go wrong that won't go well he's not great at that he's not great at that but actually tell guys you're actually really good at that if you get this right you'll be brilliant if we can get this going look where we could actually end up so it actually we're all kind of institutionalized by our environment but if you can create a really positive environment let's see where this can go because there's still an awful lot of of, of young good players and there's still a very uh, good uh, group of experienced players so uh, small small little changes could make could reap big rewards but the problem is you've got to forget about it now uh, f for for a while because there's no point going hell for letter this Six Nations to try and get the World Cup back. It's gone. The Rugby World Cup will only come around when you, you know what I mean, when you probably, real planning will probably start in January 2022. But you need to have that pre-planning before that. Would you be tempted though to, to blood a whole load of youngsters and say an initial Six Nations campaign looking four years down the road, get get some experience into the legs? And of course, yeah, but I think, uh, you want to have a good basis to put them in because if you put them in too early you'll kill their confidence and you could actually kill their careers i think it's very easy age is very little to do with this if you're good enough you're young enough if you're good enough you're old enough so if you can understand what i'm saying there it doesn't matter what you've done whether you have 100 caps under your belt or whether you have three games for your club i think that was the great thing from my time at monster you kind of knew ever before um, anything happened that the Dennis Leamy's and the Keith Earls were ready to play and the players wanted them in the team because they were like who are these boys get them on and that's what happens and in terms of you mentioned players like that James Ryan was was catapulted to the national team when he didn't have too many games at Leinster already and um, so that's a good example there yeah James Ryan I think is is a perfect example of of bringing uh, the 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 standard of play up up uh, a few levels you know he makes the game look easy i think he's thoroughly prepared i think he's a thorough professional i think he enjoys playing rugby i think um i don't know because i haven't shared a dressing room with him what his qualities as a leader are but if he's a good leader he should automatically be in contention uh, to be to be an irish captain because uh, these things kind of for some people you can overestimate it but a good leader has to have the capacity to to communicate well sometimes you can communicate through your actions it doesn't need to be words so he can lead from the front it's a great position to be captain you look at the damage or the the influence Paul O'Connell had in his career as as a leader in the second row and James Ryan I think um, an awful lot of people would say that there's huge similarities between the two of them so when it comes to the Scotland game, the Six Nations, you would plump for somebody like him then, uh, ahead of say say Johnny Saxon, who well, you know, Johnny got a taste for it during the Rugby World Cup. But he's at the other end of the spectrum, you know. I think he's thirty four. He's 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 gonna have an out half, a good out half. Is always a leader in his own right. Does he need the captaincy? I'm not too sure. And the fact that he has so much elf in his place, trying to drive the team around the pitch. W with that, he is, you have an awful lot of media work, you have an awful lot of, for example, even the coin toss interrupts your kicking routine before the game. So um, whether he's the official captain or not, he's going to be one or three people hugely important in the dressing room. So um, from my point of view, I think it's probably better that uh, the number 10 isn't the captain. I think it's better if you have a forward captain. And in terms of looking ahead to that Scotland game, if you've got... Joey Carberry fit and firing and Johnny Sexton fit and firing who would you select at 10? I think you select Johnny, Johnny Sexton because Joey Carberry hasn't presented himself fit enough to play yet when he does that consistently for Munster you may have a debate there is absolutely no debate at the minute because uh, Johnny Sexton has been whatever the number one out half for Ireland for a long time now Joey Carberry is trying to implement his game at a club level but hasn't through injury got that opportunity to consistently put pressure on, on a player like Johnny Sexton when he does that and hopefully he does that for, for Munster for the for the European Cup we can see already you know I mean some of the I suppose fallout from a World Cup is the fact that um, 
you know, he, he, he pushed his ankle, his ankle obviously probably wasn't up to playing test rugby and now he, he, he's back a few months so it'll be a challenge for himself. Time flies, he's, he'll be pushed to present himself fit, ready for the Six Nations as a player in a squad. Uh, but it's very different to trying to, to take over a player of uh, Johnny Sexton's ca capabilities. And looking at those provinces and Champions Cup, um, what do the likes of Munster and Leinster need to do? They've obviously been usurped by Saracens in the last last while. Um, where do they need, where do they need to improve? Oh, to I, do, I don't know. Is there anything uh, much difference between Saracens and Leinster? They've been the two best teams in, in Europe for a number of years. I think the two of them are ahead of other teams. Uh, the goal for all of us is try and catch those two teams because it's brilliant competition. It's it's a short competition. If you don't get it right one day, you could be out of the competition. So. Um, you know what I mean for all the clubs beneath the two of them they've set the standard uh, Saracens have, are going to be hungry now because a lot of their of their um, top players had the disappointment of a rugby world cup final that will focus them Leinster have ambitions to win it as well Munster want to try and uh, you know what I mean push for a final um, but there's an awful lot of other clubs that are trying to make dents in the competition as well 